Good afternoon and thank you for joining me for today's webinar about determining percentage entitlements in property settlements. Uh, my name's Amy Ryan. I'm a senior associate and accredited specialist here at uh, Michael Lynch Family Lawyers. As probably most of you already know, we're a specialist family law firm. We've been practicing for over 20 years. Um, we've got 11 lawyers, five of us are accredited specialists. And so we've got lots of experience to help clients with advice, negotiation, mediation, and court representation. In terms of what we do, we've got heaps of resources that are available on our website. Um, but most importantly, we provide clients with upfront cost advice at a fixed cost initial interview, which is obligation free. Um, and so we do strongly recommend that clients come and see us as soon as possible after they've separated or even if they're thinking about separating so that they can be fully informed about their situation and what might be best for them moving forward um, and how, how we might be able to assist them in that capacity. In terms of the scope of family law, it covers a whole range of things. Um, separation, divorce, property settlements, obviously parenting arrangements for children, um, child support, spouse maintenance, and all those other um, things that come within family law. Um, and another really important aspect of family law is our professional relationships with others. Um, very frequently, we have to work with um, some other professionals to help clients successfully navigate their post-separation situation. So that might be um, with accountants, either the family accountant, some forensic accountants, tax advisors, uh, financial planners, other lawyers, mediators, counsels, etc. Um, we find that often a time of separation is a time for discovering um, all sorts of tax issues that people hadn't previously thought about or other issues that arise that need to be successfully resolved um, in addition to the family law issues that they're facing. Um, about a year ago, I presented a seminar about, or a webinar, sorry, about um, the how-to of property settlement, which covered um, uh, what is property settlement? How do we assess entitlements? How do we reach an agreement? How do we finalise an agreement and some practical considerations? Uh, the recording of that seminar is available on our website um, if you're interested in some of those topics. But what we're focusing on today is how do we assess entitlements? So we're really drilling down into that particular topic. Uh, so in terms of what we're going to be covering today, we'll be talking about what is property settlement? How do we assess entitlements? Um, and in particular, looking at financial contributions, non-financial contributions, homemaking and parenting contributions, and then a future needs adjustment to work out our ultimate percentage split. So the aim of today's presentation is to upskill you in family law so that you're aware of what the issues might be, um, but of course not giving training you to give family law advice. Um, I just wanted to quickly talk about what is a divorce, just because people tend to use that term interchangeably when really what they're talking about is some other issues arising from their separation. Um, so divorce is just the legal severance of the marriage. Um, in Australia, it's a no-fault divorce system, so it doesn't matter who ended the relationship or why. The only ground for a divorce is that the marriage has broken down irretrievably, which is proved by being separated for 12 months or more at the time the application is filed. There is no obligation to um, make arrangements for children or property issues um, before the divorce is finalised, um, but that's uh, it's actually quite a straightforward administrative process really comparatively. So what we're going to be talking about today in contrast is the property settlement. So um, that is the alteration of people's existing legal entitlements to property. Um, it's available to married couples, couples and also de facto couples who meet the criteria. Um, the aim of the Family Law Act is what we call the clean break principle. What we're looking to do is extinguish the financial relationship between separated couples as far as practical once they've separated. Um, ideally, we don't want ongoing joint ownership of assets, um, joint liabilities, because it just leads to usually um, further acrimony and difficulties. When negotiating a property settlement, each party has a duty of full and frank disclosure including the exchange of financial documents. There's also a time limit to apply for property settlement, which is 12 months from the date of divorce if you're a married couple, or two years from the date of separation if you're a de facto couple. Uh, so first of all, let's dispel some myths about property settlement. First of all, there is no 50-50 rule of division. Just because you're married or in a de facto relationship doesn't mean you're entitled to 50% of whatever the net assets are. It's also not based on what you put in as what you get out necessarily. Um, we're not looking at solely financial contributions. 
property division also does not require a fire sale. Some people have the idea that everything must be sold um, to be split up. Um, we're avoiding that where possible. Sometimes assets do need to be sold to affect a division, but um, only if it's sort of the only option. So in property settlement, we talk about the steps of assessing each party's entitlement. Uh, it used to be four steps. Sometimes people refer to it as five steps now. I'm still going to talk about it as four steps with a preliminary one. The first one being uh, based on the High Court case of Stanford, is it just and equitable to proceed with property alteration? In most cases, yes. In rare cases, it may not be appropriate. And that's something that um, clients might want to get advice about if they think there's a reason that there shouldn't be a property settlement in their case. Otherwise, we follow the four steps, which are to first identify and value the net property. Step two is to consider the contributions each party have made to the um, accumulation of that net asset pool. The third step is to look at each party's future needs moving forward from the relationship and whether one party is at a disadvantage compared to the other that would result in an adjustment being made for them. And the fourth and final step is the overall division just and equitable. So let's talk in a bit more detail about those steps. So step one, what is in the asset pool? Hopefully relatively straightforward in most cases, but we're looking at identifying and valuing all of the assets, liabilities and superannuation of the parties. That includes anything in either party's name, in joint names, or owned by trusts or companies over which either or both parties have control. The value that we're talking about is the current market value, whether that be at the time the parties separate, if that's when they're doing their settlement, or it might be several years later that they're doing it. It's always the current market value, um, not the replacement value or insurance value. And that may require independent expert value valuation if the parties can't agree on what the value of a particular asset is. Step two is to look at what contributions each party has made to the accumulation of the asset pool. And we look at um, initial contributions, so essentially what each party had at the date of cohabitation, and in particular how that um, those assets, if any, have been um, used as a springboard for the accumulation of other assets during the relationship. Um, during the relationship, we look at financial uh, contributions, which of course can include income, inheritances, personal injury payouts, gifts and loans, redundancy payouts, sometimes lottery wins. It's always interesting, those ones. Um, we also look at non-financial contributions, so that might be conservation and maintenance of properties, um, renovations to property, um, managing investments and things like that. And also homemaking and parenting, which is um, a really important one, but can be a little bit hard to assess sometimes. But this can also include care provided by grandparents or other extended family members, and also care of children from other relationships. Uh, we also need to look at post-separation contributions. Um, sometimes they can be of quite a different nature to what was happening during the relationship, and particularly if the parties either delay in finalising their property settlement or Unfortunately, due to court delays at some time before their um, property settlement is dealt with, um, post-separation contributions can be quite relevant. And it, this is really a retrospective analysis. We're looking at overall all the different contributions during the relationship. How did that get us to the asset pool that we've arrived at? Um, if one party has been assessed to make a greater contribution, then they will receive a percentage adjustment in their favour. And it's very much a case by case assessment. Um, we're going to go through in detail some of the different types of contributions that can be made. Um, you'll see that their list is almost endless. Uh, so really it's about um, assessing and weighing those particular contributions in that particular case as against the particular asset pool to arrive at an assessment of what's uh, an appropriate contribution assessment. In terms of general principles, when we're assessing contributions, there is no starting point of equality. Um, the assessment of financial contributions is not a meticulous mathematical exercise. To do so, we give undue weight to direct financial contributions and overlook the indirect financial contributions, homemaking, parenting, those sorts of things. And in a long marriage where income and resources are devoted to the benefit of a family unit, it's impossible and inappropriate to have a detailed accounting of financial contributions. So this is definitely not an accounting exercise. Uh, it's more about the vibe, as it were. 
Um, when we're looking at contributions, we can either adopt an asset by asset or a global approach. Um, asset by asset means determining each party's interest in particular items of property um, and looking at each one differently. Whereas the global approach is about determining each party's interest in the overall net asset pool. Now, either approach is permissible depending on the circumstances, but generally the global approach is to be preferred. Um, there are some examples where asset by asset might be more appropriate, such as a very short relationship, perhaps where the parties have kept their um, assets separate apart from purchasing, say, a home together, um, or where there has been significant post-separation contributions, um, which need to be sort of looked at separately to the, um, uh, the pool that was accumulated up until separation. Um, some rules of thumb, they're not rules of thumb, we're not allowed to refer to them as that, but um, I guess as a general principle, when you have long marriages or relationships, whilst there's no starting point of equality, um, a finding of equality of contributions is the most likely result. The reason for that being there's usually so many numerous and varied um, contributions over time to a, a marriage partnership that um, it's very hard to sort of isolate something as being um, a contribution for which someone should be given extra credit. However, in short relationships, it's quite different. And in particular, if there are no children, then the direct financial contributions to property tend to assume greater importance than other things like homemaking um, or non-financial contributions. All right, so let's turn to look at initial contributions. Um, if a party brings significant assets into the marriage, that will be very important but the disparity of initial contributions may be diminished over a long marriage due to the other contributions made by the other party. Some people talk about this as the erosion principle. It's not so much that the value of that initial contribution is eroded over time, more that there are usually so many other contributions in a long relationship um, made by both parties that sort of mean the initial contribution has less weight overall um, in the mix with all the other contributions. So the question is really what weight is to be attached to that particular contribution relative to the other contributions. And um, part of assessing that is what um, use has been made of those assets. Um, often what happens is someone brings, say, a property into the, the relationship or significant equity in a property, and that's been used as a springboard to accumulate um, you know, the next home and the next property. And it's sort of, there's a, there's a follow through there. If it's money that's just been spent on um, you know, expenses like a holiday or something like that, um, it hasn't really reflected in the um, accumulation of the asset pool. Um, so it's really assessing how it fits into the overall mix of contributions. It's certainly not a case of um, that amount that you brought into the relationship being quarantined and you taking it back out again. Certainly not in longer relationships, perhaps more so in a sh shorter relationship. When we talk about financial contributions, we're looking at both direct and indirect financial contributions. A direct financial contribution to acquisition, of course, would be, for example, purchasing a house. Um, direct financial contributions to conservation or improvement would be things like ordinary repairs, maintenance and interest payments, which help to conserve a particular asset, such as a home. Or significant renovations, which add value, obviously, would be improvement of an asset. Um, it, it's also important though not to overlook indirect financial contributions. So for example, um, some parties might choose that one party's income pays the mortgage and the other pays for living expenses of the family. And whilst those living expenses are gone and not necessarily reflected in the asset pool, the fact that that party has done that has enabled the other party to direct all of their resources to paying down the mortgage and accumulating that asset. Looking at gifts and inheritances, often a bit of a controversial one. Um, there is no rule that any money um, that is inherited or gifted by family um, is quarantined or refunded effectively to a party. It's really about um, treating that particular gift or inheritance as a contribution from the party who received it. Um, normally, um, a gift or inheritance is taken, even if it's uh, at the time made jointly, it's usually made on behalf of the, the relative. So if it's the wife's parents, for example, gifting money to the parties to purchase a house, um, whilst they might express it at the time to be to the parties, it's really 
um, because of their relationship with the wife. So it would be the wife who would get credit for um, bringing in that gift or inheritance. Again, similar to initial contributions, we're really looking at um, what is the size of the gift or inheritance? When was it received? Was it 30 years ago or was it two months ago? And how was that gift or inheritance used? Was it actually used to accumulate some assets or so that income could be directed towards accumulating assets or was it just um, spent on, um, again, holidays or luxury items that aren't reflected in the asset pool? Again, it's a matter of weighing that gift or inheritance against all the other contributions made by each of the parties. Um, personal injuries and insurance payouts um, can be difficult. It really depends on what um, the payout has been received for um, and what it's, I guess, supposed to compensate the person who receives it for and how has it been used. So an award of damages received in a personal injury claim is property, um, although considered a contribution generally of the injured party and balanced against their future needs that may have resulted from that injury. So it may well be that um, whilst they receive a lump sum that then say is contributed to the mortgage, it's really meant to compensate them from uh, for the loss of earnings moving forward or for the pain and injury that they have suffered. So it's certainly not looked at as a windfall most of the time. It's really to compensate them for something that they have lost out on moving forward. Uh, in most cases, the damages verdict arising from a personal injury claim is a contribution of the party who received it, but it should not be considered in isolation. Um, again, we are always balancing it in the mix of overall contributions, and it may be that the other party could be held to have contributed to, to it in some way as well. Uh, often there are arguments that people receive part of their injury payout as um, uh, for, you know, for nursing and care services, which their spouse might provide to them free of charge. So um, in a sense, they are contributing to the conservation um, of that payout by not having that party having to expend their injury payout on um, personal care services. In terms of insurance payout, sometimes that can be a little bit different because they can be sometimes a little bit more of a windfall rather than exactly calculated to match the particular injury. Um, so when we're looking at the contribution assessment of an injury insurance payout for disability, um, it will depend upon factors such as who you decided to take out the insurance, how the insurance premiums were funded, and for which part of the insurance payout was received. Um, how the insurance payout was used and other contributions made by the other party for the benefit of the party who received the disability payment, so care and support. Um, a Miller is a case example um, where the husband had suffered a heart attack and received a, an insurance payout. In that case, the court said the payment was not a windfall. It was a payment received by the husband because he suffered a heart attack. It matters not that it was a minor attack from which he recovered. Despite the husband's good fortune in this regard, his health into the future is significantly compromised as a result, according to the evidence of his cardiologist. Thus, although the fact that it was a joint decision to take out the insurance and the fact that the premiums were maintained out of the party's joint funds can be treated as contributions by each of the parties, there still needed to be a life-threatening event before a payment could be made. It is simply not open to the wife to argue that the parties have contributed equally to this payout. It is the husband's money to which the wife has made an indirect contribution of a relatively minor nature. That's what the court found in that case. Redundancy payments. Um, again, this is something we come across a lot where um, particularly if they're received post separation, the parties might have some different views about how they should be considered. But um, generally speaking, redundancy payments, particularly in a long relationship, are often found to have been contributed to by both parties in a similar sense that we often look at um, a party's income or earning capacity or superannuation as being contributed to by both parties in the sense that if one person is able to sort of pursue um, a career for which they're well remunerated and the other party takes on more of the um, homemaking and parenting roles, they is seen to be contributing to that party's earning capacity and the accumulation of assets from it because they're giving that party the freedom to pursue that career without the commitments of caring for children. Um, in a recent family court case, as an example, the couple had been together for 19 years. 
during the relationship, the wife had been the homemaker and parent to their two children, while the husband had worked full time. The husband's redundancy payment, which he received after separation, was based on two times his salary, as well as a bonus to compensate him for the loss of future income. He submitted the wife had made little, if any, contribution. The wife argued that since an equality of contribution was found between the parties, it could not be said that she'd made no contribution to the redundancy payment. And the appeal court agreed with the wife, concluding that the wife had made a substantial contribution to the husband's earning and accumulation to his superation, superannuation during the marriage. All right, moving on to windfalls and lotto wins, um, which always tend to be interesting cases. Uh, in the ordinary run of marriage where income and resources are pooled, a windfall such as a lotto ticket will be treated as a joint contribution in the same way that any other purchase would be a joint contribution unless the circumstances suggest otherwise. So there are certainly a few cases getting around where the circumstances of when and who bought the ticket and what they thought they were going to do with the winnings um, can have an impact on who is assessed to have contributed the lotto win. Um, but more often than not, um, from pooled resources, a lotto ticket means that um, because there's been no special skill or particular effort involved in the lotto win, um, it's generally treated as a joint contribution of the parties. Um, similarly, other windfalls such as rezoning, um, at, which has improved the value of property, again, generally considered a windfall and therefore equal contribution of the parties because the increase in value is not due to any particular effort or act on behalf of either of the parties. Um, moving now to talk about non-financial contributions. Um, usually the most obvious one in this regard is renovations. So where a party has used their own exertion to renovate a property, property that's improved the value rather than employing tradespeople to do that work. So obviously that can include any type of renovation work um, that has um, been done by the parties to improve the value. And often um, if that is something that is disputed between the parties, we look at getting um, a valuation of the property in its current state and also asking the valuer to consider if these particular items of work hadn't been done, what would you assess the value to be at that time? And particularly if there's photographs of the property um, pre-renovation, that obviously helps with that assessment of what was the actual improvement to the value of the property that can be said to result from those renovations. Um, there are other types of non-financial contributions that can also be considered though. Um, something that I think is becoming more important and certainly it's very important to me, assistance from family members in caring for children of the marriage to allow uh, one or both of the parties to engage in paid employment or education. Um, I think that's becoming increasingly common that um, where you have two people pursuing their careers, um, that significant assistance at no cost is provided by grandparents or other family members, um, which really allows the parties to pursue those careers um, and therefore accumulate assets. Um, other non-financial contributions can include things like um, man managing the party's finances or entrepreneurial skills as an investor. Uh, the case of Whiteley back in 92 talked about the wife's contribution as muse effectively for her husband's creative activities. Um, and as I mentioned before, in terms of um, personal injuries and damages awards, um, a wife can serve the husband's damages award by performing nursing duties free of charge, which was held to be a non-financial contribution in that case of Zubik. Now, homemaking and parenting contributions, um, very important, but can be very difficult to quantify. And that's part of the reason that um, we uh, are short of focus on this area rather than focusing purely on the financial contributions because it can't be measured in the same way as direct financial contributions obviously can. So obviously um, homemaking contributions includes um, you know, cooking, cleaning, laundry, groceries, all those sorts of things around the house. Um, those um, contributions are still given weight even if there are paid workers in the house assisting with those roles particularly um, in these days where many people are balancing a homemaking and parenting role with part-time work. Um, so we don't overlook them just because there are paid workers or nannies in the house. Um, it can also include things like paying 
bills, managing the finances, liaising with tradespeople to carry out renovations and things like that. Um, all the things that go on behind the scenes to benefit the welfare of the family, which aren't necessarily measured as paid employment. Um, the reason um, I guess this gets so much attention is because the comparison of breadwinner and homemaking roles is difficult because the evaluation and comparison cannot be conducted on a level playing field. We're talking about comparing fundamentally different activities, one which contributes to property and one which contributes to the welfare of the family. The breadwinner contribution can be objectively assessed, but the homemaker contribution is vulnerable to value judgments. Um, and you would see over the um, history of cases since the Family Law Act was enacted in 1975, some very different um, ways that the homemaking and parenting role can be looked at. Um, in some early cases, it was actually assessed by looking at um, the cost of a paid housekeeper. But in the 90s, the court effectively said that wasn't an appropriate way of trying to um, assess the role of a homemaker and parent and what they add to the, the welfare of the family. Um, again, we're looking at some historical cases here. So uh, we were always talking about the wife and the husband, but of course it can be um, either a same sex relationship or the husband who takes on the primary care or homemaking role. Um, but the, the point of um, giving it some real recognition and value um, is that the person who stays home is really allowing um, the other party um, the freedom to earn an income, work the hours that they need to, to pursue their career without needing to be concerned about um, care for the children, um, which as we know is not just time spent with them, but extracurricular activities, appointments, um, all the mental load that goes into running a household. You can see that that's me in my case, that's so close to my heart. Um, but it's really important to place a value on that role um, and make sure that is assessed in a, um, or recognised in a real way, not just in a token way. Um, the English decision of Lambert really, I guess, sums up the importance of that and dismisses some of the ways it used to sort of be looked at of um, are you an excellent homemaker versus an average homemaker and the value judgments inherent in that. Um, in the case of Lambert, they said the danger of gender discrimination resulting from a finding of special financial contributions is plain. If all that is regarded is the scale of the breadwinner's success, then discrimination is almost bound to follow, since there is no equal opportunity for the homemaker to demonstrate the scale of her comparable success. Examples cited of the mother who cares for a handicapped child seem to me both theoretical and distasteful. Such sacrifices and achievements are the product of love and commitment and are not to be counted in cash. The more driven the breadwinner, the less available will he be physically and emotionally, both as a husband and a father. Discussion of homemaking and parenting contributions really leads into or ties into um, the controversial area of special skills or special contributions. Um, the special skills doctrine is um, sort of dismissed in the cases now, but still lurking around. And it's about um, where there has been a special or extraordinary contribution which should result in extra weight given to that contribution, particularly if it results in the creation of large wealth. So the type of cases we're talking about are where um, the parties have started with nothing and due to the business acumen of one of the parties, they've accumulated massive wealth um, or, you know, people who have really um, innovated, invented something, done something which um, has created such a large asset pool that it seems like it needs to be um, given special weight. Um, there, however, there's controversy in the case law as to if and when the doctrine should apply. Um, and there's some um, cases which favour what we call the special skills doctrine and others which favour what we call the marriage partnership. So the special skills doctrine um, particularly came from a high court case of Mallet back in the 80s. Um, no doubt a conclusion in favour of equality of contribution will be more readily reached where the property in issue is a matrimonial home or superannuation benefits or pension entitlements and the marriage is of long standing. It will be otherwise when the property in issue consists of assets acquired by one party whose ability and energy has enabled the establishment of an extensive business enterprise to which the other party has made no financial contribution and where the other party's role does not extend beyond the homemaker and parent. 
So again, they're talking about one person being an entrepreneurial genius, the other person being a housewife. Um, should the husband in that case be given extra credit for the fact that he's amassed massive wealth um, whilst all the wife has done has looked after the home front. Um, the flip side to that, the marriage partnership argument, um, which comes from a case of Figgins primarily, is marriage is and should be regarded as a genuine partnership to which each brings different gifts. The fact that one is productive of money, even in large quantities, is no reason to disadvantage the other. Um, this all sort of came to a head in 2012 with a Brisbane decision of Fields and Smith, which went on appeal. Um, in this particular case, it was a very long marriage of 29 years until separation. There was a further four years until trial and five and a half years until appeal. Sounds fun, doesn't it? Uh, the husband and wife were aged in their 50s. The marriage produced three children, all adults at the time of trial. And it was agreed that neither party had made any significant initial contributions. So essentially they started that 29 year uh, relationship with nothing. Um, during the relationship, the parties established a construction business on the Gold Coast of which the husband was the driving force. The wife was also directly involved in the business to some extent as a director and shareholder. The parties had sold 16% of the business to four of their employees in 2006 and they had built their extravagant home, which was completed in 2008 and was agreed to have a value at trial of $10 million. The total asset pool, including that home, um, was between 32.3 and 39.8 million. At, at trial, the judge rejected both the special skills doctrine and the marriage partnership doctrine, but instead made a 60-40 assessment of contributions in favor of the husband, because of his ingenuity and stewardship with respect to the business. Sounds like special skills by another name. So the case went on appeal to the full court and the crux of the arguments at appeal was an assertion by the husband that his contributions should be seen as special or unique or out of the ordinary and an assertion by the wife that the wealth of the parties of whatever type and however described is a result of an economic, domestic and emotional partnership such as it, that it is unjust or inequitable to distinguish between their contributions. Obviously the special contribution in this case was the creation of a very successful business which started in 1990 and developed to the point at trial in 2012 of having a value of 32 to 39 million. Um, what the full court said in that case is the words of section 79 which is the section which talks about this four-step process and assessment of contributions rather well, not specifically the process, but the things we have to look at, um, does not provide endorsement for any category of contribution related to any class of property, for example, high wealth, being by virtue of that category or class more valuable or important than another. In each case, the contributions made by the parties must be evaluated in the context of the facts of the case. What that essentially is saying is um, there's not a monetary threshold over which um, you fall into some special category where there must be some special skill behind it um, that means someone should get extra credit for that. It's really about assessing in the particular case what actual contributions did each party make um, and even though the husband in this case might be seen to have special skills it's really did he use those skills then to um, make a contribution that can uh, assisted the parties to accumulate that wealth and they approved of the assessment of the trial judge in that case of a 60-40 assessment of contributions because of um, I think he had this sort of a unique design for buildings which he then sold very profitably and that's how they developed that building business. Um, the case of Greer and Malthus which has followed the Smith and Fields um, again tries to sort of explain that concept a bit more clearly to say it's not the party's skill set which must be considered but their contributions. Contributions are the product of, of many things, talent, industry, selfness, selflessness and indeed luck to name a few. It is the contributions in all senses in which that expression is used that fall for consideration and assessment, not the combination of factors that has created the capacity for the making of those contributions. So again, perhaps a bit technical, but they're, what they're trying to say is it's not because someone has particularly amazing skills, it's how have they used those and has it resulted in a particularly special contribution. But again, um, 
it's by no means a settled area and there's a lot of controversy about these particular types of cases. So um, in big money cases in particular, that's often something that um, we like to look into in a lot more detail. Um, turning now to the issue of post-separation contributions. All that really means is contributions made by either party after they've separated, but before they have finalised their property settlement. Now, this can be more complicated um, where there are delays either in proceedings where the parties have not got around to formalising a property settlement um, or they're waiting for the court to deal with their case, which unfortunately at the moment there are quite significant delays. And it becomes particularly complicated if something unexpected happens after separation. Large windfall gains, gifts for inheritances in particular, uh, which can cause problems. Um, it's important again that um, people tend to get a little bit focused on the financial contributions that they're making post separation, particularly the primary income earner who might now be diverting all that those funds to savings rather than to support of the family um, and feel like those um, contributions should be quarantined. But it's important not to overlook that there are also post separation contributions in the realm of homemaking and parenting um, that also need to be considered. Um, Sometimes, if there's been a long period and the parties have essentially gone their separate ways, um, starting to take an asset by asset approach rather than a global approach is more appropriate, either for all of the assets or some particular asset that has been acquired post separation. So that's just something to keep in mind. What's really important to keep in mind is that um, even in cases where you think you're in the clear, um, you might not be. There are cases where um, post-separation inheritances, lottery wins, um, and um, assets that have been accumulated from lucrative post-separation employment have all been included in the asset pool available for division, and the other party has been assessed due to their homemaking and parenting contributions um, during and post-separation to have been held to contribute to them and they've been divided along with everything else in the asset pool. So um, ideally get your settlement done as quickly as possible after separation, um, otherwise you might be finding some of these things become quite complicated, um, particularly with those large windfalls. I think in the case of Calvin and McTeer um, it was something like um, an $8 million post-separation inheritance. Farmer and Bramley was a $5 million lottery win where the parties had nothing at separation, but the wife had um, cared for the child of the relationship who I think had a disability and the husband was a drug addict. She got a large portion of that lotto win, even though he'd, he'd won it some time after separation. So uh, where possible, um, dot your I's and cross your T's and get your property settlement sorted out as soon as possible once you've finished, uh, once the relationship is finished. Um, again, just looking at the importance of that homemaking and parenting contribution, which um, in a number of cases has got them over the line in for those post-separation contributions. Um, not only must contributions of all types be considered over the whole of the time up to trial, but also the post-separation period can see contributions of a type made during the marriage become more onerous. For example, homemaker and parent contributions made within a household comprising the marriage partners and children, which are made by one party after separation, may be more extensive. In other words, someone who's lumped with the sole care of the children post-separation can be seen to be making actually a greater homemaking and parenting contribution than they were during the relationship because it's all left solely to them post-separation. All right, now let's talk about bad behaviour. Sometimes we refer to this as negative contributions. Unfortunately, to the disappointment of many clients, infidelity and other moral wrongs are generally not relevant to the assessment of contributions. Um, but in my experience, it can certainly be relevant to the dynamics of the parties' negotiations. Um, However, there are some limited range of cases where um, those things do start to become relevant. Um, the main case in this area talks about losses incurred by both, either or both of the parties during the marriage. For example, bad investment decisions should generally be shared, although not necessarily equally, unless one of the parties embarked upon a course of conduct designed to reduce or minimise the pool of assets. 
or one of the parties has acted recklessly, negligently or wantonly with matrimonial assets, the overall effect of which has reduced or minimised their value. Very common examples of what we call wasteful behaviour, that's the reckless, negligent or wanton behaviour, um, can be wasting funds on gambling, alcohol, drug use, um, deliberately um, churning through savings, so as to defeat the, the uh, entitlement of the other person, those can all be um, deemed to be essentially a negative contribution, although the, um, the wasted funds can be added back into the pool as a notional asset. Some examples of some um, waste cases, Nickus and Anthus, the husband's gambling of between 200 and 400,000 was found to be in no way proportionate to the party's lifestyle, or to his contributions during the course of the relationship. So the gambling was an aspect of the party's contributions which led to a finding that the husband's contribution to the non-inherited assets was only 10%. So essentially whatever other contributions he's made were um, offset by this negative contribution um, of the funds that he wasted on gambling. Now again, um, as I mentioned there, proportionate to their lifestyle. Um, in a case where say, there was a $30 million pool, that level of gambling would be irrelevant. Um, in a small asset pool, that could be quite significant. Um, the case of Karen and Laniga um, was an unusual one where the deterioration of a house while the husband had sole occupation of it was considered. And the trial judge found that the husband had wasted part of the value of the home. Um, part of that was based on a valuation where um, it was originally valued at 525,000. At the time of trial, the expert said it was worth 270 to 300,000, but would have been in the mid 500s if it was in average condition. The husband had cash available to fund the repairs, which the wife did not. Um, but he also didn't really explain why he hadn't repaired it. And it seemed to be beyond just mere inattention to regular maintenance. Um, the husband told the expert, the property was structurally unsound and access to the house was only by way of a step ladder propped against the side of a house. So sometimes um, parties acts of um, revenge post separation of, uh, can backfire on them as it appeared to in this case of this husband. Um, domestic violence um, can be relevant um, in a narrow range of cases if it impacts on the victim's capacity to contribute. Um, I expect this is an area that's going to be developing more um, in future with the case law given the um, focus on um, the real and lasting impact of domestic violence that has been um, at the forefront in the last few years. Um, but the main principle comes from a case of Kennan back in 97. Um, and they've said in that case that where there is a course of violent conduct by one party towards the other during the marriage, which is demonstrated to have a significant adverse impact upon that party's contribution to the marriage, or put another way, to have made his or her contributions significantly more arduous than they ought to have been, that is a fact which a trial judge is entitled to take into account in assessing the party's respective contributions. Um, that is something that um, can be very difficult to prove um, in terms of trying to ask a victim of domestic violence to quantify effectively um, how that impact of that violence stopped them from being able to contribute themselves. Um, so at the moment it's a very narrow range where you have to show there's been, I guess, an economic impact of that domestic violence, um, but hopefully that's something that um, develops further in the case law as we become more attuned to um, the real impact of this issue um, on um, parties to a relationship. Okay, so now moving on to step three, which is where we start to look, um, instead of looking retrospectively, like we did with contributions, where we look back at how did we get to the asset pool that we've got, we're now looking prospectively forward from separation into the future. Um, looking at each party's respective circumstances and what we call future needs and how does that, um, uh, is one party at a disadvantage compared to the other and should they be compensated for that out of the asset pool. Um, so we talk about identifying future needs factors which might be relevant in any particular case. The most common factors are comparative ages and health. 
Um, obviously, if someone is significantly younger than another party, they might have much more of a working life ahead of them. Um, any health issues can be important in the sense of either limiting a person's capacity to work and provide for their own needs. Um, it also might involve significant cost if their particular health issue um, involves a lot of treatment um, or expensive treatment. Um, respective incomes and earning capacity, of course, is important. And we're looking at earning capacity rather than necessarily income. Um, lots of clients like to say, well, I'm just gonna quit my job and then we'll see what happens. Uh, no, we're still looking at your capacity. So if you've been working in a particular capacity for a particular period of time, suddenly quitting your job isn't going to um, absolve you of that obligation. Um, likewise, um, each party when they're separated has an expectation that they will utilise their earning capacity. Now, particularly if someone um, has taken on a homemaking and parenting role during the relationship, um, suddenly being expected to work full time and pick up where they left off with their career 10 years ago may not be realistic, but they still need to accept that um, their situation is different now. Um, we're now looking at a situation where we have two households moving forward um, and we can't expect that each party's financial situation will be the same as what it was during the relationship. So they need to look at exercising the earning capacity that they have and getting up to a point where it's maximised, I suppose. Um, care of children um, obviously is important. We'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. Um, the duration of the marriage and the effect on a party's earning capacity. Again, that's really looking at the issue of um, what role has the party taken during the relationship and um, has that had an impact on their own career? Often what happens in many relationships still is that one party's career will come first and the other parties might take a back seat either um, to care for family, um, sometimes to move with the party who's pursuing their career. Um, and those things, particularly over a long period of time, may have, had, may have had a significant impact on the party's earning capacity. They may have started off on an equal footing many years ago, but if a long period of time out of the workforce is what's happened because of the relationship, then obviously that's gonna have a significant impact on them. Um, retaining an asset with a contingent capital gains tax liability. Um, what I'm talking about there is sometimes we refer to it as a um, a CGT pregnant asset where one party um, is taking on, let's say the parties have um, a, a house, um, the residential property, or sorry, the, the matrimonial home that they live in, um, and they also have an investment property. Um, unless that investment property is being sold, then the estimated capital gains tax on that property is not going to be included as a liability. Obviously, um, if something is to be sold to affect the property settlement, then um, the realisation costs, including tax, need to be taken into account. But if it's a case of um, the matrimonial home is being transferred from joint names to one party, and the investment property is being transferred from joint names to the other party, that doesn't crystallise the capital gains tax liability at that point. But the party taking on that asset needs to be aware that there may be, if and when that property is sold in the future, um, a capital gains tax liability. And sometimes if that asset has been held for quite a period of time, that might be quite a significant liability. So while we're not taking into account um, as a, a exact figure taken off the top of the asset pool, it needs to be um, considered as something that's relevant to that party's financial circumstances moving forward. Um, future prospective inheritance, um, that tends to be relevant where um, the inheritance is very proximate. Um, just because someone expects that one day they will inherit whatever their parents' property is, doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to, um, and therefore the court isn't going to take that into account because things could change, relationships could sour, um, those assets could reduce in value, um, they could decide to leave it all to the um, RSPCA instead. Um, as long as the, the person who um, is making the will has the capacity to change it, um, the court is unlikely to consider that as being something that's relevant. Whereas um, if we have a situation where um, the person's, say, parent is 
elderly, um, they don't really have the capacity to change their will anymore. And I mean, in terms of the mental capacity at law to change their will, um, and they're in ill health, it might be that actually, um, you know, the expectation of receiving uh, a sizable inheritance is something that is relevant um, as comparing each party's future needs moving forward. Um, the final one, one I've mentioned there on my list is a disparity in asset position of the parties. So um, in some cases, for example, an inheritance that has been received, say, very late in the relationship or sometimes post-separation can actually be essentially excluded because the other party hasn't contributed to it. So you might have a situation where, say, the net asset pool of the parties that they had accumulated together is $1 million and there's an inheritance of $500,000, that's excluded from that pool available to divide between the parties. However, um, we sort of don't ignore it altogether because then we start look at this future needs um, uh, assessment. We might be in a situation where the, the parties' assets are split 50-50, so 500,000 to each, but the party who received the inheritance has actually got a million dollars in assets, not 500,000, and should an adjustment be made um, to the other party to reflect that they're not in the same financial position as that party. So it can be a bit of a double whammy that even if you get to exclude something um, that's been received post-separation or that the other party has been deemed not to make a contribution towards, it doesn't mean that it's totally ignored for the purposes of the future needs assessment. So overall, uh, as you're getting the idea, basically if one party has greater future needs compared to the other, then they'll receive a percentage adjustment in their favour. Um, sometimes we like to talk about it as a bit of a pendulum. You're not supposed to start at 50-50, but for the purposes of this uh, explanation, I guess that's often a good place to start. And then is there something in the contributions that means it should swing back one way or the other in one party's favour? And should the future needs adjust it back the other way? That's sort of how we're looking at those percentages. Um, just some general principles about future needs. The court must take into account all relevant factors. Weight, the weight to be attached to each factor is a matter for the court's discretion. In other words, it's all about the vibe, um, to quote the castle. Um, the relationship between property settlement and spouse maintenance. Um, I'm not really covering spouse maintenance today, but that's really um, the, I guess, ongoing payments from one spouse to another after parties have separated. Um, in Australia, that's not such a common feature, not like in the movies where the Americans like to talk about alimony being paid and things like that. Um, coming back to that um, clean break philosophy, the idea is ideally to have the parties to end their financial relationship when they are separated. Ideally, you don't want a situation where one party is beholden to the other to pay them um, money on an ongoing basis to support themselves. Um, and likewise, you don't want the other spouse to have to be um, you know, handing out cash every week to support the other party. So this is where um, this future needs adjustment is about trying to not exactly compensate for spouse maintenance, but basically if one party is at greater need than the other, to give them a greater share of the asset pool to then, you know, make the most of, um, but to still go their separate ways. So in terms of the relationship between property settlement and spouse maintenance, we always look at the property settlement first, and then maintenance is only looked at in terms of what is that party's need for maintenance? taking into account their earning capacity, but importantly, taking into account the property settlement they've received. So again, we're trying to avoid double dipping there, um, but giving the person who's at greater need the opportunity to have a greater portion of the asset pool, if possible, um, to then use that to you know, support themselves and compensate for the fact that they might not be able to financially recover from the relationship um, as well as the other party. However, um, the cases are clear to, um, make it clear that the assessment of future needs is not a process of social engineering or trying to compensate for someone, um, you know, having some bad luck, I suppose, or being in a bad situation. Um, it's also important that we look at the future needs adjustment and the contributions adjustment for that matter in monetary terms rather than just strictly percentage terms. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, people talk about, you know, my friend got 70%. Well, what's the 70% of? Obviously, in a small asset pool, um, every extra 10% is relatively 
small um, and it might be appropriate to get quite a high percentage of an asset pool, particularly if the um, the asset pool is small, but say the, the other party earns a very significant income. Um, it's different when you have a large asset pool and every percentage is a lot of extra money. Um, so you find that in smaller pools, you might tend to have a larger percentage split, um, particularly for future needs to reflect that disparity. Um, whereas larger pools, um, again, looking at the monetary terms, um, one or 2% might actually make quite a lot of difference. Um, just coming back to earning capacity, um, again, it's um, open to a court to give weight to the ability of a party to earn income, especially where the opportunity clearly exists to utilise that ability. Whether it is or is not appropriate to require a party to work particular hours or work in a particular occupation is a question peculiarly within the province of a trial judge and needs to be measured on a case-by-case -case basis. So again, there's no clear or strict rule about, well, the relationship's over, you must go and work full time, you must return to a particular career that you didn't like, or it was fine for you to be a stay-at-home parent during the relationship, but now you must work full time. Um, it really depends on the particular circumstances of the case, um, not only the party's personal circumstances, but the overall, um, I guess, financial circumstances of the parties and what's reasonable um, in those circumstances. Um, I've had a case where um, one of the parties previously worked as a chef and had good employment as a chef, but was actually allergic um, to a number of food items, which meant that she was constantly getting ill from work and it wasn't really appropriate for her to continue in that employment, despite the husband's views to the contrary. So um, you can find some unusual cases where particularly if um, a previous career has been departed from because of reasons of impact on health or mental health, um, to suddenly uh, at separation expect the other party to go back into that role is not always realistic. Care of children. Um, again, we're not really talking about the issue of child support today, but as the cases make clear, the payment of child support in no way compensates the custodial parent for the loss of career opportunity, lack of employment mobility, and the restriction on an independent lifestyle, which the obligation to care for children usually entails. So that's why the care of children is often one of the most significant future needs factors. Um, it's the impact on lifestyle, it's the need to have um, suitable accommodation for the children and all of the bits and pieces that go with that. Um, extracurricular activities, it's a huge um, uh, impact. You know, ideally parents are sharing that care of children post-separation, but that's not always the case. Um, and even if the parents are sharing time relatively equally, often one parent is still, um, for want of a better word, the primary carer in terms of they're the ones that organise the birthday parties, the medical appointments, the extracurricular activities. They're the ones expected to take time off work if the children are sick. Um, and all of that just impacts on the ability to just independently pursue a career without thought to those matters. So that's why care of children is often one of um, care of children and earning capacity are really the two main future needs factors that impact almost every case. Um, life expectancy can be uh, an interesting and particularly an awkward one, um, but is also becoming a bit more um, uh, common in terms of particularly older couples choosing to separate. Um, unfortunately, if you have a short life expectancy, um, that also means you don't have much in the way of future needs. So um, the other party might um, uh, get more of an advantage from that particular issue. And so you do sometimes see cases where um, doctor's reports and things like that are relied on in terms of um, an unfortunately short earning capacity, oh, sorry, short life expectancy of one party, um, almost extinguishing their future needs. Um, the fourth and final step, our assessment of entitlements, um, is the concluding one, justice and equity, looking at the overall result. So um, effectively, we've added up steps two and three, the contributions and the future needs. What we're now looking at, is it overall just and equitable? So it's important to not just look at what is the percentage, um, again, important to look at that in monetary terms versus the size of the asset pool. 
but also is the actual um, order that we're proposing and the practical effect of it just and equitable? Um, by that I mean, is it appropriate that this party gets this particular mix of assets? Do we have to sell something to affect the property settlement that we're looking to achieve? Um, is it a case that, for example, the pool is supposed to be set, uh, split 60-40? The person um, who's getting 60% wants to retain the house, um, but to do so they really need 61%, otherwise it needs to get sold, in which case then we have to take into account realisation costs and things like that. So is it therefore better that they get 61% than 60% um, to give an overall just and equitable result? So it's about the practical effect of the orders and the specific asset pool, not just the percentages. Um, a particularly important aspect of that in many cases is superannuation. Um, often that is one of the largest assets of the parties and depending on their ages and attitudes, um, it can be very desirable or very undesirable to have that large share of superannuation. Um, for parties that are young, they often don't put a lot of value on that and what they're looking for is non superannuation assets to be able to say purchase a new home. Um, so there is no rule that superannuation needs to be divided in any particular way. It's just treated as one of the other assets. Um, and so the mix of assets, including superannuation is discretionary. Um, again, just repeating that clean break philosophy, um, which comes from section 81 of the act and says the court shall, as far as practicable, make such orders as will finally determine the financial relationships between the parties to the marriage and avoid further proceedings between them. I.e. we want to extinguish the financial relationship between separated couples as far as practical. The reason um, I suppose and to avoid the ongoing joint ownership of assets is it tends to create further problems. Um, we have many clients who say we're just going to hold on to this house until the market improves or something like that. Um, the reality, particularly if we're talking about their proposal to do that so for a couple of years, is that things tend to get complicated in the meantime. The market doesn't always go up, sometimes it goes down. Um, sometimes other circumstances of life happen, in particular um, new partners come along and suddenly the priority of keeping the house um, is gone and the priority of purchasing a property with the new partner, with the new child, for example, takes precedence and then you're stuck in a situation where one party wants to sell and the other doesn't. So um, while some clients might initially think it's a good idea, we always strongly discourage ongoing joint ownership of assets. Um, sometimes it's unavoidable when, for example, there's a business that's of significant um, value and it's impossible to pay one party out and things like that. Um, but wherever possible, we're looking to avoid that ongoing financial relationship and for the parties to go their separate ways, um, if we can, in that final step. Thank you so much for joining me from the webinar today. Um, if you've got any questions, please feel free to shoot us an email at our email address there. I'm more than happy to um, take any questions about today. I realise I've covered lots of different topics and lots of different types of contributions and future needs. Um, as you've probably gathered, they are all um, very unique and each case is different. So if you've got any questions, um, please feel free to ask those and we'll do our best to answer them for you. Um, and also if there's any particular topics that you think are of particular interest or that you'd like to present, uh, that would you'd like us to present to you, please don't hesitate to contact us about that. Um, as we've mentioned there, we've got all of our past webinars are available on the website along with um, other publications and articles which you and your clients might find of assistance. And we have another upcoming webinar next week about relocation with children, which I'm sure will be very interesting. So um, there's lots of resources available on our website, but please feel free to contact us if there's anything we can help you with. Thank you.